the two guys. Yeah, you know, we use, you know, you have gambling in Belgrade. Gambling all over Belgrade. Yeah. But anyway, you shoot guys on the street and, it, and, and, and it's illegal. And the police would come and run and all that stuff. So this boxer used to, um, uh, he used to shoot dice with us. And he used to fight people all the time because he would cheat people out of money and stuff like that. So that was the last time I saw him. I saw this guy named Mark McKnight. But Mark McKnight is from, um, uh, he's really from Cleveland. But he, but he went to, prison in my hometown, which that's the main economy now, the penal institution. And then so when he got out, he became a professional boxer. So there was this infamous fight that happened. There was, um, um, I'm a sports guy, actually, you can't here in sports, but um, like one of the better American sports teams was the 1906, 1976 Olympic boxing team that fought in Montreal it was the, it was the Summer Olympic Games. And it had a lot of famous fighters on that team. And Art McKnight was fighting one of those famous fighters, this guy named um, Sugar Ray Leonard. And so you can see on the wall there, uh, you can see the fight poster and the advertisement for that boxing match. And my uncle uh, went down there for that fight, and he said he was too drunk to remember any of it. But um, the fight was called in the seventh round, and I don't know if you've seen Martin Scorsese's um, uh, uh, Raging Bull, and there's a scene in Raging Bull where people throw chairs on. That's what happened there. The, the fight was called way too soon, and all the people from my hometown who went to see the fight, they started rioting. But nobody would talk about that kind of because they thought it was embarrassing. Because everybody was all drunk and stuff like that. So, so then I wanted to make a, a film, an artwork about that fight, and uh, this famous boxer that Art McDonald fought with Sugar Ray Leonard. Um, you can't find any material on that fight because he was cut during the fight. And so all over the world, and even I got a hold of the ABC, like a television network girl in London, and they didn't have a tape of that fight. So, so I had to recreate that fight through Art McKnight's um, uh, memory and everything else. And then you can see a, a, a piece of projection there uh, that was, uh, we had to train a, a boxer to like, uh, to participate, to take over Art McKnight's moves in that fight. So this piece of art right here is based on this particular person and this and this particular fight. Now what happened at the end of the fight, like the refs and everybody was wanting the Sugar Ray Leonard to win. So Art McKnight was called a technical knockout, but he really wasn't knocked out. And so people started riding. So it was supposed to be an eight round fight, but but it only went to seven rounds. So on the wall you're gonna see these cards where I don't know, boxing is popular here. But they have a ring person, a ring girl, pretty much, kind of walk around with the bike. So, so that's what those cards uh, represent. So I guess you could kind of go in. So on this wall here, you have the actual boxing uh, poster that was that I I think I found it online. But then I eventually saw somebody who had one. So we recreated it, and this is what you would put um, this image here. You would put um, put it like this image here. You know, like we're putting the newspaper um, that would compare the fighters, like their weight, their height, their reach, and you know, like, and so, you know, like, and so to speak, whatever. And then, and then, so I just wanted to like not have any other kind of images. So I had uh, all the, uh, the like the rounds that were involved in the fight, and and then even the round eight that that what that did not happen, so to speak. And so, and this particular image here was shot. And again, I come from. Um, um, I, like I come from not a film school, I was telling the students earlier, but I come from um, an art background where my uh, my two degrees were actually in uh, photography. I did sculpture, printmaking, um, painting, artist books, stuff like that. So I'm always into with materiality, and I still do sculpture. Um, a lot of uh, I make a lot of props for the film. That you see, these were actually props for, uh, for the film. Uh, but also too, um, um, I shot the film. I, I shot this with a 16 millimeter movie camera, and the small daylight school reel is a, is a three minute um, long exposure film, and then each box around is three minutes. So I asked the fighter uh, just punch for exactly uh, three minutes for a whole round. So there's another art object made from this. Uh, this this event is called Round 7, which is a 19-minute uh, experimental film about the fight. 
and then Art McKnight, um, um, I actually would describe each round. And then we have this like young uh, Golden Gloves boxer, like reinterpret the rounds that Art McKnight, uh, the fight that Art McKnight well, what, no, was in. But also too, in this particular film, Art McKnight spent a lot of time um, in a penal institution, locked up in jail. But he makes this great comment about in America, um, like, and like after you go to high school, you have to go to college, and most colleges are expensive. I um, mean, even state schools could be like twenty-two to twenty-three thousand dollars a year. But to actually lock up a person and put him in jail in the United States, especially to Ohio, it's like it's a between twenty-seven and twenty-nine thousand dollars a year to feed and clothe and health care for somebody. So it's actually more expensive to put somebody in jail than it is, is to educate them. So in the African American community, I think in the early 90s, there was actually more black American men that were in jail than they were in academic institutions and stuff. And, and then again, I always tell my students, you know, people talk about, I think in the past years, a lot of times, like marijuana has been legalized and stuff like that. And as I always tell my students, like drugs have always been legal in the white community, but never in the black community. Like, like the expensive high schools where people have drugs, and the police aren't, the police don't have dogs sniffing around for drugs in those places. But everybody knows that's where the drugs are. They always come in the black community and harass the black community, so to speak. So that's why, like, um, over 80% of people who sell and do drugs in the United States are of European descent, but almost 90% percent of people who are in jail for drugs are of, um, are either uh, like a like um, Hispanic um, like, like with descent or African American descent. So the whole idea of, of like putting somebody in jail um, costs more than the university doesn't bother the state at all because it's about controlling the uh, population so to speak. So Art McKnight in that particular film kind of talks about, you know, his, you know, um, he even knows that particular uh, and information. So this is like this uh, part of the show, round seven. So I guess is it good. So this is another. Uh, I, well, I like I forgot about this piece. There's actually four components to, to, to this exhibition, and well, this is a film called Poly uh, Two, and it's basically a Super Eight exposure of the uh, 2017 eclipse that happened through the through the United States. Uh, when I filmed this, I was in this small town called Saluda, North Carolina, and to get total blackness of the eclipse, you have to be in something called, and then eclipses when, you know, like the moon, the blocks of sun's going to speak, and then so to be in total blackness, you have to be in something called total totality, whatever. So we were in 99.8% total, 99.8% uh, totality which means it never got dark. So our calculations of where we had to be were off by about three kilometers. And I was like, fuck, uh, <laughs> darn, this kid's here. <laughs> Heck, <laughs> these two gentlemen here are looking at me like that. <laughs> you know, so, but I can keep it PG. I can keep it, there's no gangster here tonight. <laughs> but anyway, so, but anyway, so anyway, so we all, so I had a bunch of friends and stuff, and these family members, come down and help shoot the eclipse, and we didn't think we had anything interesting. Because my whole strategy was to have like, like uh, about three minutes of sun eclipse and about two and a half minutes of total blackness. With audio, if you ever lived through the, the eclipse, as soon as it turns dark, you hear the crickets and stuff. So all the animals react like if it's night. And then, and then the rest of the exposure would be a little bit of sun. So it's gonna be like a 10 minute long take which is the most ex unedited exposure that you can have with 16 millimeter movie film. So we didn't, so we were in the wrong spot, so we didn't get that. So uh, for this particular film, there's two of them. There's poly one and poly two. Poly one is a color 16 millimeter exposure. This is a super eight, which is a smaller film gauge. Um, it's more like a tourist movie film or vacation film that was invented from, by a Kodak in, in 1965. So anyway, so we end up getting um, this amazing look at the sun and the light because the way the lens would re reflect with the glass and the lens, and, and then the sun, you get this kind of crazy exposure. Now, um, I have other films, um, I was telling, I was showing the, this, uh, this class today, 
um, I have a whole body of work where I'm looking up at the sky. Like we have a like a telescope at the University of Virginia, um, uh, and then I rigged up my movie camera to go on the telescope, and then I filmed the moon and stuff. So I'm, so I'm fascinated with these kind of phenomena, uh, these kind of I guess univer uh, uni uh, the universe like phenomena, and I like that as a um, as a formal quality, like the way the light and the sun, and, uh, and then also, I don't know if everybody looks through a telescope, but when you look through a telescope, you realize how small you are in the whole, like you can't be self-centered. I mean, you could, but, but it wouldn't make it to be self-centered by you understanding that where your place is in the universe. And for me, that's a kind of fascinating thing about this, about these kind of uh, phenomena. And also, too, what was interesting, too, is that we had a lot of clouds, too, as well, so it made it a little bit more kind of textual uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the eclipse. Um, and this is actually uh, a 34-minute long exposure, but I sped it up so it can have like a little bit of... So I think, it's, I think it opens like 13 uh, minutes long. Um, next month, um, the next... Well, since we didn't get full totality with this eclipse, um, kind of a bragging about this old school guy, and I was saying, gosh darn it, because the kids are here. Gosh darn it! <laughs> I'm trying to cuss. <laughs> like, well, wherever the eclipse is on planet Earth, we're going. Because normally there is an eclipse on planet Earth, but it's not on dry land. So the next eclipse is July 2nd in Chile, and through Argentina. So we already booked a flight for my crew, and we're all going down to Chile, hopefully get to Totality. So hopefully I'll get invited back to Serbia and show the other version of the sun, um, of the solar eclipse. And, 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 and the title of it is Polly 1, or Polly 2, and then I'm called Polly 1. My grandmother, uh, her nickname was Polly, and she passed away the day before the eclipse, so I named it after her. Uh, I like the way uh, these films are kind of arranged here in the gallery. Uh, normally, um, uh, I was telling this class today, like, I, I have several bodies of art, of, of film work. I have film works about, about labor, about athletics, about landscape, about the sky, about the universe. And then also I have um, uh, films that I make for theatrical release, uh, meaning in the theater, that I call for a passive audience. Some for an active audience, for a gallery, um, uh, so people can kind of walk in and out. And, but when I shoot films for the gallery, um, all my films sometimes usually play in the gallery, but sometimes like the film, like this Polly stuff was, just when I was shooting that film, I wanted to play in a, a museum or a gallery. And when I shoot films for a gallery, I want the subject matter uh, to affect the conditions in the space. Like I want either the subject matter to make um, the space darker, or lighter, bluer, or redder, or whatnot. So um, the moon film that I'm describing is that it's a 10 minute take of one shot of space to moon where, where it lights the gallery. And the other shot is from moon to space where it darkens the gallery. So I like that as like a subject matter. And this particular film is called 93. Uh, my daughter's great grandfather, uh, James uh, like Williams, passed away about four years, years ago. But at the time this was made, he was 93 years old. So we got 93 candles, because you can't have 94, you can't have 92, you can have 93 candles, and put it on some facsimile of a cake, because we had about a bunch of cakes, and there's wax on it, so thank God it's black and white, you can see the kind of color of the cake. But anyway, so I wanted him, I wanted his condition as an elderly man to make the gallery dark. So this would normally be in one whole room or gallery, I like this. And then so he would eventually blow out the uh, candles. Not trick candles, a lot of people think, but these are actual candles. And then being a sculptor, you learn about what materials really quick. You, you, you understand wood, you understand bronze, you, you understand steel, but I had to learn about candles. So I ended up going to a witch store where there's witches in Cleveland, Ohio. And there's probably some, nobody saw it. Any witches here? <laughs> I hope so. Because, you know, like, they ought to get down, right? <coughs> but anyway, so, but anyway, so, they had better candles that wouldn't burn out as quick. So 
So by the time you light 93 candles, they all would be kind of gone by the time you finish like, lighting the candle. Because it, because it takes a long time. So anyway, so I just had, so we did about six takes. I think this might have been the third take of him blowing out like, uh, like candles. So it took him like 48 seconds to blow out the candles. But I had this camera called an Airy BL that didn't do slow motion. So it was doing 24 frames a second. So I, I ended up slowing, slowing it down in post uh, production. Uh, the film in the middle is kind of like um, the boxing film, Walter Wade. I'm making films about uh, my hometown and about products about from my hometown. I used to work in this place called Weston House, back like they said. And we made, my summer when I worked there, we made um, dryers. Uh, and so they made washing dryers, but, but, but my floor made dryers, and I worked there for like 12 weeks in the summer. And, but also I looked online about the history of the products that Weston House made, and then they made irons. So, so I make props for some of the films, but in this particular, but now I've been making props that don't function. So this is a, an iron made out of, uh, cast out of rubber. So it doesn't really kind of work. So I had my cousin, Mississippi, uh, Derek Whitfield Jr. Uh, tried to iron the sheets out of uh, this rubber uh, iron that doesn't quite like function, so to speak. So I'm making all these products. So I made, uh, so they made binoculars during World War II, and they made uh, one of their early vacuum cleaners, uh, handheld vacuum cleaners, in the '60s, and they made a waffle iron. So those are the images that are on the, the uh, card, uh, so to speak. So I cast it all in black, and then, and then this film stock, like this is normal uh, black and white, uh, 60 millimeter film, but, but this is a really high contrast film stock from NASA that Kodak made, so that I guess you would film stars and stuff like that are uh, spy on uh, people, <laughs> like the government does. <laughs> but anyway, so anyway, so, anyway uh, so I just made sure that I made black irons, and then so, there was this famous uh, African American painter named Kerry James Marshall. Let me skip to that. Him, but he also paints people completely jet black, these kind of shadows. So I was kind of painted homage to him by having this particular film being jet black and then all like, almost like erase the kind of skin tone and stuff. So it almost kind of makes it like kind of shadow. So. so anyway, and also too, again, I like uh, these 16 millimeter cameras because I can manipulate the cameras. So this particular camera has an option of hand cranking, like Charlie Chapman was to kind of hand crank the films. So just when you hand crank it, like here's why it seems like it's going a little bit faster, yeah, because that's how the film is. Um, the film is going through the camera manually through my arm, so to speak. If I can slow it down and speed it up. So that's uh, what's, so so. There's a series of these films with irons, and then I just made one with a vacuum cleaner, and then you know, I have some more binocular films in the works in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the film on the your left, I think I'm pulling the left, right, 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 um, is a kind of, I'm making these series of films um, about my hometown, but I'm making them as like Andy Warhol screen test. Have you ever seen those films, Andy Warhol? He would shoot all these people from the factory in New York. Uh, some famous actors, some not, some, you know, some junkies. You know, it's like Susan Sontag, you make these kind of three minute takes. So then so I've been like filming either like relatives or, or people from my hometown. And then I've been making these kind of, um, kind of annual off screen tests of these people. This is kind of your stars. Like some of the other things I have, um, again, I was talking about the, uh, the drug laws a little bit in the other room. Um, I had a lot of friends that were addicted to drugs in the uh, 80s and 90s. And I made these kind of portraits of people who actually survived the kind of drug wars so that were going on in the United States in the 90s. So that's like, so like that's what that film uh, the rep the represents. Uh, this is the third time it actually played in a gallery. For years, um, well, it's only a few years old, but but prior to that, it usually plays in movie theaters. So you buy your ticket. Sit in there for eight hours. No, I'll put that for but but it's funny. Um, uh, there's been multiple people that stayed for the full eight hours, and I can tell because I'm usually introducing the film at nine o'clock in the morning, and I can tell like that guy. I'm gonna see him in, at like at five p.m. <laughs> and sure enough, I do, and I got to take him out to dinner. 
because I feel like he suffered enough, so I'm not the same person. But when I was in Korea, there was a 71 year old guy stayed for the full um, eight hours, and we had to get a translator to get to speak English, so we took him out to dinner. And he said he liked it because he used to work in a, um, he was a retired um, guy who worked in the factory that made jewelry, so to speak. So he's just like, like watching the tools. Um, but anyway, but anyway, so this was a film. So for years, um, I wanted to make a film that was eight hours long. There was this, uh, what was one of my favorite filmmakers, this Filipino filmmaker named La Diaz. I don't know if you've ever heard of this cat. But uh, he's, a, he's a good friend of mine, and he makes nine hour narrative films. And they are exhausting. And if it takes 20 minutes for the oxen cart to come up the road, it takes 20 minutes for the oxen cart to come up the road. It's like real. But the one thing about it is like, you know, you get sucked into like the fourth hour. You're like, I can't stay. I gotta go. And usually, I'm, I'm at a film festival, just kind of watching it. So normally, my film is playing. So right when I leave, you know, the nun is a hooker and the prostitute is a nun. You're like, fuck. Fudge! <laughs> My narrative is all screwed up, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the narrative is all screwed up, and then, so he does these weird things at certain moments of the film. But, it, but then I like the fact that um, the longer you stay with somebody, I think the more the humanity kind of comes out, so to speak, instead of just kind of chopping it up, kind of editing. Because like once you edit a film, and then those of you in film, film school or filmmakers know that once you edit, you're telling somebody what to think. So for me, I like things to kind of draw out in time so you can kind of formulate your own idea, so to speak. So, so anyway, so, then I, so I wanted to make something long, and then I, and since I used to work in the factories, my uncle's worked in the factories, my aunt worked in the factories, so I wanted to uh, film a big ticket product. Like, it's like a, just like a car, a refrigerator, or a washer dryer, I used to work at. So I wanted to film a product from start to finish for eight hours. You know, film different kind of workers. So um, it's hard to get permission to film in these industrial places because, like, I don't know, like cop copyright or, or whatever, or trade secrets to speak. So for about a decade, I was trying to find a factory to shoot in. So I got permission to film in uh, Mechanicsville, Virginia, this place called Cubica, where they make bowling alley supplies. Now, they, People were hip to the sport bowling. Um, I used to bowl, my uncle used to bowl. My dad and uncle was a pro man. I got cousins a pro man bowler. So the title of the film is called Park Lanes, because that's the name of the bowling alley or the bowling facility in my hometown, Park Lanes. Um, so this place makes, um, you know, makes bowling out. Like it makes everything but the balls and pins. They make all the lanes, like the wood floor, uh, the machines that take the pins and all that kind of stuff throughout the factory. So since they didn't have an assembly line of uh, 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 production, um, I had to figure out what was my narrative. If I have a narrative for eight hours, you better have a narrative. Um, or or some effects of a narrative. So, what I, so then, um, so the thing was filmed, there was three cameras. Uh, I'm gonna nerd out here. There's three uh, pocket, uh, two block, two pocket black magic cameras with C mount uh, like lenses on it, and also there's a new camera. And this is the footage shot of this camera called a digital Bolex. There was a thing called digital Bolex that was, and, it, and you know, I had the very first one. Um, and then I would do that. So I did like shoot, it, it, like get some, like some of that. So then, so the film was shot with HD because I couldn't use enough 16 millimeter uh, like to put it to get an eight hour long movie. So, um, so I ended up like framing up things. So I took on a narrative. So I was there for three days. And at first I was following around this, uh, this uh, young person. She was this one woman. She had about, I think she had two kids. And I liked talking to her, she was nice. I thought she would be my narrator, uh, what my narrator. But she ended up being the, what the, the uh, ticket clock in and clock out, so I did use her a little bit. I thought she'd be my, but then, so I thought about some other things about the products, so I kind of follow products. But then, since being an artist, I like filming things that look like artistry, so I basically filmed things that look like sculptural objects. So, like in the film, you'll see these weird looking shapes, and for me, they look like abstract kind of sculptures. So I end up going uh, like the, with that. So, the longest take in this film. Uh, we were early today, and lunch was playing. 
and lunch is 33 minutes. And you see these guys like just staring at their phones. And then there's another scene at 17 minutes, but most of them are like 10, 3, 4 minutes. Um, I think it depends on the uh, the uh, craft and, and the events and what's going on. So anyway, so the, the people that were super nice, and then again, I didn't really know what it was going to be. So then I did do interviews with people. So I have a whole series of, uh, I think you've seen the trailers, right? Mm -hmm. And so I have like a shit, uh, truckload of trailers. And then they were um, of just interviews of some of the people. So we, we did interview people, but, but, uh, but the actual film doesn't really have much talking in it, except for lunch, so to speak. And a little bit during one of the first morning breaks, whatever. But folks always said, like, how, you know, was this film hard to make? It was the easiest film they had. All I did was just put in the, on, like, on the uh, digital timeline, just put in the clock in, you know, just put it in a morning break, um, lunch, and an afternoon break, and then put the clock out, and then just filled it up, so to speak. So, so I remember I shot it in March, was it 14, 15, a oh, 14, and then I had to finish, and then I had a rough cut by April, and then I sat, you know, I sat with the film, and, and then I think I finished it in August. So anyway, so like, that was a kind of, um, and then also the employees here, they were mostly African-Americans, uh, Laotians, and Vietnamese, and a few white people, but, but, it, was, but it was mostly people of color, like in there. Um, what else to say about it? Um, it's actually watchable in a weird way. <laughs> you know, it's actually, you go in the movie theater, it's actually like, huh. I actually physically sat, I mean, I've seen it a million times, but I actually saw it in the movie theater when it first premiered at the Rotterdam Festival. I sat in there all day. And I think I left to get my picture taken for about 10, 15 minutes and came back, whatever. So, so, so I did watch the whole, the whole thing. But for me, I like these kind of contractions, and so these kind of weird things that don't make sense. And then also, and also, I have another strategy too with some of the, the films, and I like to have people do stuff on screen, don't explain it to the audience. So I like the fact that the people on screen are smarter than the audience. So they know what they're doing, they know how to handle the machinery, and you, the author, uh, you, the viewer, have to kind of catch up. So, um, there's something else about this thing that's kind of crazy. Uh, we didn't have any accidents. Oh, no, I remember um, that they had some corporate secrets there. Like, there was areas, uh, is this being recorded? No, <laughs> okay, I'm not. But anyway, there was areas that were not supposed to film. And then so I had some of my students, like, uh, like help me. And then so I saw them film in areas where you know, we, that we weren't supposed to be. And I was like, <laughs> you know. So I didn't really pay attention to that, whatever. But, um, but yeah. Um, and then also the color too. Uh, this black magic kind of makes this kind of um, mocha, smoky, kind of almost monochromatic look that I actually kind of, that, that I kind of like that. But also too, I actually shot about six or seven other films with other cameras in there too as well. And those films are pretty short. But then, you know, again, like, I didn't want the viewer to have a work experience, so to speak. But I did want, for me, it was more about my experience of, of constructing this thing. It's not for the viewer to sit here. I mean, like, viewer can sit here for the whole eight hours of time. But for me, it was more about the whole idea of this being a thing, a physical thing. And, and there's a possibility that you could sit through this thing for, for, uh, for like, a full eight hours. Um, yeah, it, that's... You know, I kind of like that. So we got some good parts here. I think we're going to get some like uh, wellness and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And it's pretty loud too, as well, at some point, whatever. Uh, but it then, like, again, at first, I, I remember, uh, like, I, like, I was thinking about this film, and then, like, I, a few years ago, I made, uh, like, uh, like, a few films, and I remember, I, like, halfway through the, um, uh, the shoot, I actually broke my foot. <laughs> And then I couldn't look through the viewfinder in the films. I had people who actually did a great job of filming it and shooting, shooting it. But I realized when I broke my foot that when I was editing the film, that I do a lot of editing in my head, like when I'm looking through the viewfinder. And I remember that shit, like with the shots. <laughs> my two friends here. So uh, I, I was like, I remember, um, you know, 
and then that one, and I realized that I do a lot of the, the, the post-production editing work <laughs> looking through the viewfinder. So I remember when we, when we first got permission to shoot, because I think it was summer after I broke my foot, I, was like, I couldn't wait to film. And at first, I had designed this film to play in the gallery for a long period of time. But it took me um, about 10 minutes is when I shot the first scene of these guys painting. And then I told my buddy, my man Khalil, like, a uh, pedicide, I, like, I was saying, this is a theater. I knew it like right away where this was going to go, so to speak. So um, last year, this film opened at the Carnegie International, which is a big show in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and then that's the first time it played um, in all day, every day for eight hours and stuff. So I was kind of weary on it. But, um, but I kind of like it now. So I think it had its theatrical run, so now I like the fact that it plays um, in these kind of uh, situations. I don't know, anybody any questions? What is the average wage for the supporters? Oh, yeah, good question. Um, oh, yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about, yeah. They make, um, I think they were making like $11 an hour, uh, which is... With taxes or the Before taxes are taken out, yeah, yeah, so not much. Before, yeah, yeah, and yeah, that's yeah, a good question, because uh, this is, this is, Mechanicsville, Virginia. And the northern states in the United States have unions. In the south, there isn't any, like, like the union employees. And also, too, um, they work four days a week, 10 hours a day. So it's cheaper for the factory to stay open four days than five days. So, they, so, so again, they're making, saving uh, money. So they don't have a lot of the rights that a lot of um, the union employees make in, um, uh, in the northern parts of, of America. And I, I, it, it may be going on here, I don't know if it goes on here, but um, like all the, like, just like Americans don't make anything anymore, like we, uh, because uh, America was founded on slavery. And that's how I got there. My ancestors had got there. But then it has a desire to go back to it. So they don't want to pay any employees, so to speak. So uh, eventually, I can't imagine this factory being in this place in the next 10 years. I think they'll probably move somewhere else and stuff. And then a lot of the products that we're making had Mandarin on it. So uh, bowling is big in China now. So all, all, a lot of the stuff is being shipped to uh, China, so to speak. So I think that's a good question to speak, how much they make to speak, so yeah. Yeah, so good question, so, yeah. And Oh, I had the, the workers just clocking out for the day. So, like, it was supposed to be, although it was a three day film, eight hours, so it's all manufactured through me. It's all invented because their work day is 10 hours. So, I just had them check out, so to speak, and then, so that's how the film ends of them, like, not working, you know, like, like kind of like getting off the work, so to speak. Uh, did you have some restrictions during the shooting? Yeah, the uh, company said I couldn't film certain people in certain areas around the company. Like a certain area of the floor, because they had our research and development, so I couldn't film in those areas, so to speak. Yeah. But that was about it, yeah, that was about it, yeah. They didn't really bother us that much. And they didn't really check on us that much. Because as long as we weren't getting in the way of production, so to speak, yeah. But everybody had signed the, you know, waiver and all that kind of stuff too as well. And it was in a residence, a lot of people didn't want to be in the film. And then I'm fine with that, whatever. But as we kept going on, like there's some, like the last day, folks were upset because they weren't in the film, but they told us they didn't want to be in it, so we had to go film them, you know, just to make them, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, but that was about it.